Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Springs Church. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, I'm excited to share God's word with you today. As Pastor Rory was saying, uh, t today's series, we're going to continue with a series called Ox. Um, it's about love, relationships, and the church. So uh, I really like to take the month of February and just speak into relationships. Everybody knows how important, influential, impactful our relationships are. I mean, relationships are the things that can bring us the most joy in life, the most uh, rewarding experiences. Relationships are, are just so good for us. But also, they can be extremely difficult. And they can be destructive at times. But I want to talk about that uh, this morning as we go into the message. Uh, and here's our theme verse. It comes from Romans chapter 12. If you have your notes, just go ahead and I'm going to give you lots of scriptures and, and uh, points today so that you can jot down. Go ahead and grab your notes and a pen. And I um, um, just want to encourage you to value God's word, you know. Uh, as we uh, as we learn, as we dive into the scripture, the more that you value God's word, the more that he will speak to you. So I want to encourage you to do that. But, but as we look into Romans chapter two, chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. The Apostle Paul says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How many of you know that the world and this culture bombards us with messages that we see on TV, movies, from Hollywood, even social media? Did you see the Super Bowl halftime show? Well, like all kinds of uh, messages bombard us about how we should be, how we should look, how we should act, how we should speak, how we should relate to others. Um, and there is so much pressure on us from day to day to conform to that, to give in to it. There's so many temptations for us just to fit in Blend in and act like everyone else in the world. Amen? But there's something that we need to do because our minds are often filled with so much junk. So many deceptive ideas, so many false things that we have been fed throughout the years that we need to take a stand and actually push back on some of the ideas and some of the thoughts that we have allowed to enter our mind from this culture and replace those things with the truth of God's word. How many of you know that God's way is always better? We can try our way. We can try what the world tells us to do. We can try what social media or this or that tries to influence us to do. But we know that God's way is always better. Well, His way is always more peaceful. His way is full of enjoyment and reward. And no, it's not always easy. But His way is always the better way. So what I want to do is just take a little time and contrast the world's way versus God's way, especially when it comes to love and relationships. Are you still with me, everybody? Okay, let's talk about the world's way. The world's way, number one, you got to find that right person. That person that you just hit it off with, that, oh, there is this chemistry, it's your soulmate, and all of those things. You gotta find the right person. Then, number two, you gotta fall in love, right? You gotta fall in love. Love is like a ditch. I said it last week, we fall into it, right? Okay, well, you just gotta fall in love, have all the feelings, all the ushy, gushy, gooey stuff. And it's just going to be wonderful forever. Right? This is, this is marriage. Marriage is easy. Right? Any, any married people in the house today? Okay. Put your hands down. Any single people in the house today? Look around. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, 
fall in love. And then number three, the world will tell you, you better fix all your hopes, all your dreams on them. Boy, they become the center of the universe. All your decisions, everything that you do revolves around them. Keeping them happy. Making them just the center and the source of everything good in your life. Fix all your hopes and all your dreams on them. This is a setup for disaster. But this is what the world will tell you is the romantic thing to do. Oh, it's a relationship made in Hollywood, man. Marriage is easy. So the world says fix all your hopes and dreams on them. And then number four, it says if, if failure occurs, just do it all over again. Just step one, step two, step three, all over again. I got to tell you, this is the world's way and this is not a good way to do it. Amen. Now, let's contrast this with God's way. Number one, become the right person. Instead of trying to find the right person, how about we make a decision to become the right person? And say, God, would you help me? Would you shape me? Would you mold me into the man or the woman that you have called me to be? Lord, would you help me to grow in my relationship with you? Lord, would you make you my number one? Because at the right time and at the right place, your number one, the Lord, will bring along the person who is for you. So if you focus on your relationship with God, God will provide that other person in his time and in his way. The second part is this. Not fall in love. Walk in love. The Bible says to walk in love. We walk in love towards God. We love God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we love other people as ourselves. God calls us daily, every day, make that decision. God, would you help me to walk in love? It's not about falling in love. It's about walking in it. And number three is this, fix all of your hopes and dreams on God. And when you do this, you learn that God is faithful. We sang about it earlier. Boy, he is faithful. All of his promises are yes and amen. And let me tell you, there is nothing sweeter than a relationship with God through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we've set our hopes and set our dreams on, on our relationship with God and all of his promises and encouragement and hope for us, we will not be disappointed. God's way is always better. And then how many of you know that failure is going to occur from time to time, right? Anybody, anybody the perfect Christian? Okay. Anybody ever make no mistakes at all? Okay, I didn't think so. But like, we will fail from time to time. And what does God want us to do? Repeat the steps. One, two, and three. We become the right person. We walk in love. We fix all of our hopes and dreams on God. You see, there is a world's way for your relationships, for your love, for your marriage. And then there is God's way. God's way is always a hundred times a million times, infinity times better than anything that we could imagine. Uh, as we continue to focus on learning God's way for our relationships and our, and our marriages, uh, I want to zero in really on this idea of commitment today. Would you say that word with me? Commitment. Say it like you mean it, like you're committed. Commitment. Okay. One guy, one guy said it this way. He said, please be aware that I am totally committed to remain fully uncommitted to commitment. <laughs> well, that's one way to say you got commitment issues, right? And I heard one lady just say, the only thing I am committed to are my commitment issues. <laughs> and here's one just for fun. Um, here's a joke. What do you call a fruit who's afraid of commitment? Anybody know? A can't elope. 
You're welcome. You are welcome. <laughs> Friends, it's, it's important that in our relationships or in our marriage, if it's going to succeed, if it's going to be strong and healthy and godly, we have to come back to a place of deep, unwavering commitment. Deep, unwavering commitment. The truth is, it's inevitable that we're going to go through tough days. We're going to go through tough seasons. We're going to experience stress, pressure, disagreements, heated arguments, fights, difficulties. You're going to get angry. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get ticked off. You're going to feel disappointed and discouraged in your relationships from time to time. And you may even be tempted to throw in the towel, right? You may be even tempted to call it quits, hit the door, and toss it all away. But there's a, there's a word that's a pretty uncommon word and unpopular in our culture, in our day and age. And, but God uses this word to describe his relationship with his people. I want you to look at this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. The Lord says... Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Friends, God wants to bring us to a place in our relationships and in our marriage of deep, unwavering commitment. Honestly, throughout our 18 years of marriage, uh, Ashley and I have fought, we've disagreed, we've fought. We've got mad, we've fought, we've got fed up with each other. Did I mention that we fought? We've argued about sex, money, kids, uh, schedules, quality time, romance, chores, housekeeping, pet peeves, and in-laws. I could continue, <laughs> but I'll spare you. But can anyone relate? If you're married, you know that it's, e that it's not easy. <laughs> but listen, like most couples, we've had rough seasons throughout our marriage, but we've made one of the most important life-changing decisions early on in our marriage. We went through premarital counseling with the pastor who married us, and he's the one who instructed us to do this. And it's changed everything about our relationship. He, he said this, take the D word off the table. That's, that's what he told us. And, you know, we're, we're engaged, and we're dating, and we're lovey-dovey, and all that. We're on, you know, honeymoon status. And we didn't understand what he was really saying. We didn't understand that tough times would come. We didn't understand at that time that there would be fighting and arguments and disagreements and all of those things that are natural in any relationship. But he said this, take the D word, divorce, off the table as an option in your marriage. Just go ahead and say it is not an option. We don't threaten each other with it. Don't manipulate each other with it. Just go ahead and remove it 100% from your vocabulary. And what we did with that word is that we applied that word. And so now, from time to time, we do still fight. We do still argue. We do still have disagreements. But you know what? At the beginning of the, of, the, of the fight, of the discussion, whatever, we always say, I'm committed. I'm 100% in. I will not leave you. I will not threaten to leave you. And we're going to fight and we're going to work this out in the context of commitment. In the context of of commitment. So take the that would that would be a word of encouragement for all of you who are married or soon to be married or you wish to be married one day. Just take the D word 
out of your vocabulary. Because we're in this thing come hell or high water. We will, we will never threaten each other to leave. Babe, you're stuck with me. <laughs> and I'm stuck with you. And yes, we will, have, we will have to work through our problems. We will have to work through our difficulties. But we will always do it in the safe and secure context of 100% commitment. Is this making sense this morning? Okay. <clears throat> Listen, honestly, the world tells us opposing messages all the time. Boy, you better have your prenuptial agreement ready, right? They will tell you, well, you better keep your options open. Well, if this relationship doesn't work out, guess what? You can just dispose of it and try a new one. And maybe next time it will work out better. But God says... Wait a minute. I'm interested in commitment. I will never leave you or forsake you. And because of that, I'm going to empower you to be able to say that in your marriage, in your relationships. God says, I'm committed to you and I want you to be 100% committed to the most important relationships in your life. The prophet Malachi in chapter 2, it's the last book of the Old Testament, he issues a strong word to God's people. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 13, it says this You flood the Lord's altar with tears, lots of crying, lots of wailing, lots of whining going on. You're upset, you're sad. You weep and you wail because God no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask, why? What have I done? What's going on? What has changed God? Why is he no longer happy with what I'm doing for him, he says this it is because the Lord is the witness. He's watching our lives. He is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been, look at that word, unfaithful. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. He is not the one, has not the one God made you. You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Look at this. Godly offspring. Boy, how many of you know that God is interested in the next generation? He is interested in the kids and the youth and the teenagers growing up in godly homes and being godly themselves. He says, godly offspring. So be on your guard. Like, watch out. Be aware of what's going on. Be on your guard and do not be, what? Unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So he ends this passage by saying these words. So be on guard. And do not be unfaithful. Do not be unfaithful. You see, God in the scripture, he's really, really serious about this. And if we will listen, we will learn that God's way is always the better way. It's better for you. It's better for your marriage. It's better for your most important relationships. It's better for your children. It's better for all those around you. And it's better for all those who will follow you. Now, let me say a couple things here because um, I think they're important to say. No, I'm not saying that you should stay in an abusive relationship. Any kind of abuse in a relationship is completely unacceptable and should never be tolerated. Second thing I want to say is this. No, I'm not saying that you're doomed to hell 
if you've experienced a divorce or a separation. Because with God, there is always forgiveness. He is the God of all grace. And there is always a second chance. There is always grace and restoration with God. But what I am saying is this. Commitment and faithfulness is a big deal to God. And I'm praying that this day forward, this is what I've been praying all week for every one of us, is that we will reaffirm our commitments in our marriages and our most important relationships. Came across this definition of commitments. I want to show it to you. It's up on the screen. It's probably the best definition I've ever read about what commitment is. Here it is. Commitment is staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. (laughs) Amen? Well, I see this all the time. I have the opportunity and joy to perform weddings from time to time here in town. And guess what? The mood is always there. The flowers, the music, everybody's had showers, including the groom. Everybody looks great, and then they say it, right? For richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. I'm committed, they say. And then what about when the mood has left you? Commitment is not just about having to endure suffering or stick it out for the kids. Rather, commitment is what actually makes a relationship flourish. Commitment is actually what makes the relationship great. Commitment is actually what sets the stage for true intimacy and enjoyment. And I just have a simple goal today to speak over your lives and speak into your relationships. I just want you to think again about your commitments. Remake them. Reaffirm them. You want to be able, I want you to be able to say to the most important people in your life, I know there will come a day when things will get hard. And the mood that we set it in is going to evaporate. But in that day, you can count on me. In that day, I'm not going anywhere. In that day, I'm not going to threaten to leave you. In that day, I'm not going to manipulate you in any way. And I am willing to be temporarily uncomfortable while we work things out. I'm committed. I'm all in. But pastor, well, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through and how I've been hurt by relationships. Pastor, what you're saying cannot be done. I can't do it. I screwed up too much. I've gone too far. I can't forgive. I can't be forgiven myself. I can't make things right. I can't love well. I'm incapable of changing. In fact, I'm on my second, my third, my fourth marriage. I just keep failing when it comes to love and relationships. I just keep struggling. I keep messing things up, and I just cannot do it. But the Bible comes along and gives us a powerful word in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul said this, And I want you to take this as yours today. He said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can. 
Come on, say it like you mean it. I can do all things. Wait, wait, wait. All things means your relationships too. All things means your marriage too. I can do all things. Now here's the most important part. Say it with me. Through Christ. Through your relationship with Jesus Christ. Through your study of the word. Through your prayer time, through your drawing upon the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The Apostle Paul said it in his, con- in his condition. He wrote this in a, in a jail cell, speaking of being able to put up with any condition that he was in. And some of you may be in a difficult position today in your relationships, but I want to encourage you that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Will you allow him to change your life from the inside out? Will you allow him, will you draw upon his strength to accomplish his will for your life? The beautiful thing about God is that when he calls us to do something, he, he always models it for us first, and then he gives us the power and the ability to do it. So he's not like, I want you to do this, but you're on your own. Good luck. No. He says, I want you to do this because this is what I did for you, and this is the power that I want to give you to do it. Does that make sense? So that's the reason why Paul could say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to do it. Now, during the last few minutes here, I want to share with you five profound commitments that God has made to each one of you. Five profound things that the God of the universe The almighty creator God who has redeemed you, who has saved you, who has made all things. He has made some commitments, some powerful, profound, and simple commitments to you. Now as I share these with you, I want you to jot them down and I I don't want you to do them. I just want you to realize them. Because if you, if you realize the commitments that God has made for you, God will do an amazing transformational kind of work in your heart. And he will give you the power and the encouragement to show that to other people. Especially in your most important relationships and your marriages. Number one is this. God says, I commit to prioritize you. God says, you are my priority. He values you. You are important to him. And he didn't just tell us with words. He showed us with action. It says this in 1 John chapter 3. He said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And because of that, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. And here's what I want you to get this morning. He did so that I can. He did so that I can. If you're married here today, I would tell you this. Your marriage has got to be priority. Above work, above hobbies, above kids, above friends, above your own comfort, above your own convenience. God has prioritized me. Therefore, I can prioritize Ashley and make that relationship the most important thing in my life. 
Number two is this. God says, I commit to pursue you. I love this. God is pursuing you. He's after you. He is after your heart. He's not out to get you. He's out to love you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And you know what? From time to time, I'll tell you what I do. I I can stiff arm God pretty good. I can say, God, no thanks. I got this. No thanks. I want to do it my way. But you know what God does? He still pursues me. He's still coming after me. Why? Because he wants my heart. He wants to walk with me. He wants to be known by me. And he wants that intimate relationship with me. So he never stops. No matter how hard we fight against him, he'll never stop. He keeps knocking. Knocking on the door of your heart saying, can I come in? Can we have a relationship? God is committed to pursuing you. It says this in, Re- in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. What's he want to do? He wants fellowship. He wants relationship. And he said, no matter what, I will pursue you. And here's the thing we need to remember. He did so that I can. He pursues me, and I will pursue her. Number three is this. I commit to possess you. Now, let me explain that because that sounds kind of weird. God says, I commit to possess you. Listen, God is very committed to this sense of belonging. He considers you his very own. We read in scripture that we have been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ has bought us. Then 1 Peter, it says this in chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy nation. You are God's very own Look at that word, possession. God says, I'm yours, and you are mine. He did so that I can. And now I can turn to Ashley in our marriage and say, I am yours, and you are mine. Everything about me is yours, and everything about you is mine. We possess one another. He did so that I can. Number four is this. God says, I am committed to protect you. Because, boy, there are times when the attacks will be coming in. There will be dangers. There will be um, opposition from here, from there, from the culture, from family, from friends, from the enemy spiritual warfare but what is God committed to he says I'm committed to protect you from all dangers Psalm 121 verse 7 and God will guard my life this is a commitment that God Almighty has made to his children he did so that I can and now I say, Ashley, I will protect you. I will protect you in prayer. I will protect you with my actions. I will protect you with my words. I will protect you from negativity and harmful things. I will protect you even from disrespectful kids. Hello. Yeah. If my kids want to be disrespectful, they're going to have to come through me first before they get to her. I will protect her from even disrespectful children. Listen, he did so I can. 
Number five, God says, I commit to purify you. I commit to purify you. Now, to understand what that means, we have to know that we are all works in progress, right? No one is perfect. No one has it, has it all together, including the one speaking to you now. We're going to blow it from time to time, but guess what? God gives us grace. We're going to blow it from time to time, but he delights to show us his mercy. We're going to blow it from time to time, but he delights to forgive. He loves to help, and he loves to show us the better way. This is the God of all grace. And so we look at chapter and verses like Ephesians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul speaks to husbands directly. He says this, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Look, look at these words. To make her holy. To make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church. Without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. But holy and blameless. And he goes on to say this. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. God is so committed to helping us to be holy, to be blameless, to be blemish free, to be healthy, to be fully set apart to Him. He's so committed to purifying us. And here's the wonderful thing He did so that I can. With my wife, I can help her to grow spiritually. I can help her to grow in love. I can help her. I can, I can do devotions with her. I can pray with her every day. I can do things that will help her in her spiritual life become the woman of God that God called her to be. He did so that I can. Is this making any sense to anybody? So friends, if we will embrace God's way, embrace God's way of true commitment. We will see the blessings and the favor of God on our relationships and on our marriages like never before. But we've got to reject what the culture tells us. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to grow in your relationships? Are you willing to think about reaffirming, remaking your own commitments in your marriage, in your most important relationships? Are you willing to do that? Just like God has done for you, I would tell all of us here, it's so important. Commit and stay committed. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God of all grace. And I pray, Lord, that now, as we have looked to your word, that you will just begin the heart transformation in each one of us. Lord, I can't change people. That's your job. And so, Lord, let our hearts be open. Let our minds be open to receive your truth and to apply it to our relationships. Help us, Lord, to be people of deep, unwavering commitment. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.